uh, so I will be talking about uh, triangles in random graphs and this is going to be joint work with uh, Justin Gilman uh, who is a PhD student of Mike Sachs. Uh, okay, good. So the basic question of this talk, it is very easy to state. Uh, we will look at the random graph g n 1 half. Okay, so, you have n vertices and independently between each pair of vertices, you uh, put in an edge with probability 1 half, uh, g n 1 half and now we look at S n which is the number of triangles in, in this graph g. Okay, and, the, and the question is what is the distribution of S n? Okay, next talk. <laughs> uh, distribution of uh, SN. Actually, there is a reason, there is T is something else later on. Uh, whoa. Oh, I see. Good. Ah, okay, good. I hope I didn't break it. Okay. Ah, okay, great. Okay, good. The question, so the question is, what is the distribution of S n? Uh, good. So, so let me say some basic things about S n, which are just uh, obvious, and then, uh, and then we'll let's try to, and I'll say a few things about what's known about S n, and then I'll tell you the main theorem of our, uh, of our paper. So, first here, just to get normalizations right, here's a simple observation: the expected value of S n is one eighth of n choose three. Right, because at n choose three possible triangles, each one shows up with probability one eighth. Uh, another observation is that the variance of S n. So this is something that can be calculated by looking at uh, these n choose three events and uh, seeing how they relate to each other. The variance of S n is just a simple calculation. Is uh, well, it's theta of n to the four. Okay, and this I'm calling sigma n square. This I'm calling mu. Okay, so. So, it would be reasonable to expect that uh, uh, the number of triangles is around 1 8 n q, uh, so 1 8 of n choose 3 plus minus some constant multiple of sigma n, which is plus minus some constant n, n square. Okay, so, that is what that is what you would expect maybe from of the distribution of S n. Okay, so, and then uh, so people study this very heavily and uh, this has been extensively studied the distribution of number of triangles and in general the distribution of subgraph counts. And uh, uh, so, after lots of work, and I'll uh, and I'll state the a lot of relevant authors now. The the following central limit theorem for the distribution of S n was was proved. Okay, so this is the central limit theorem for S n. And uh, so it says that so for all a and b, uh, the probability. This, so these are fixed constants. The probability that S n lies between mu n plus a sigma n, mu n plus b sigma n. This is what you would expect if S n is Gaussianly distributed with the appropriate mean and variance. So, this is uh, integral from a to b of the standard normal distribution between a and b. So, e to the minus x square over 2 dx 1 over root 2 pi. So, this is the central limit theorem for the distribution of the number of triangles. Uh, and it says roughly that uh, when you look at the distribution of the number of triangles up to intervals of uh, length being, uh, uh, when you look at intervals of length order of sigma n, you see uh, yeah, the, the distribution of the number of triangles behaves like a standard normal value. But this is when n goes to infinity? This is as n goes to infinity. Oh, right. Good, good. Oh, there is a, I forgot the most important part. Yeah, plus, uh, uh, yeah, so you could either say limit as n goes to infinity of this quantity exists and it is this or you can say this quantity is this plus little over. Yeah. This is not known for clicks in general and it is known for uh, sub any subgraph count. 
Uh, oh no, for, so for, for all subclass counts. But we are in g n 1 half, so we are in constant oh, p. Right. Uh, so good. So so there is. So so now I'll list some names and I'll uh, and I'll say that problems of this kind have been extensively studied for g n p for general p and uh, all kinds of variations of this are known. So I'll say a little bit about that too. So so the names uh, relevant are so there's Ruchinsky, uh, Karonsky, Barbour. Uh, Noviki, uh, Janssen, Weyermann, and uh, for central limit theorems, as far as I know, maybe not. Uh, so, so this, is, so various subsets of these authors have uh, found central limit theorems for distribution of subgraph counts, distribution of joint distribution of subgraph of pair subgraph counts for many different subgraphs. Uh, uh, and yeah, uh, uh, what happens when this half is replaced by a function of n and when is there a central limit theorem? So, this has been extensively studied. Uh, good. There is a lot more stuff that I am not talking about which talks about just in general properties of the distribution of S n such as tail bounds and things like that. When uh, when the when you look at GNP where P is not necessarily a constant, uh, good. Okay, so so this is this is the setting for the problem that I'm going to talk about. So you're, you're not really you don't really care how fast it goes to distribution. Oh uh, no, so uh, uh, I will care uh, later on, but and people do care, and uh, such things have also been heavily studied by subsets of these authors and also non-subsets of these authors. Uh, but but just for but uh, let me just focus on this statement for the moment. Uh, okay, so suppose I told you this statement, and uh, and then I wanted to say okay, so based on this, what would you say the probability that S n is equal to mu n is? What would you what would your guess for that be? Right. Uh, so it's yeah. So I mean here I know that S n, when viewed from far away, looks basically like a normal distribution. So it's not unreasonable to expect that point-wise, every value that S n, the probability that uh, S n takes any particular integer value, is what that normal density would suggest. Okay. So so that's that's going to be the main statement of uh, of this work. Uh, so I'll tell you the statement of that. Uh, So, so this is this is the main theorem. Uh, the probability that S n is equal to k is equal to well, okay. So, uh, okay. So, I'll, uh, there will be some normalization. Uh, you'll s it should be clear why such a normalization is needed. So, one over square root two pi sigma n e to the minus k minus mu n over sigma n square over 2 uh, plus little o of, well, what is the magnitude of this quantity? The magnitude of this quantity is uh, is roughly 1 over sigma n. Sigma n is around n square. So, it is plus little o 1 over n square. So, it is smaller than that. Okay, so, uh, so it's smaller than this when k is between mu n plus minus constant times sigma n. If k is further away from mu n than a constant multiple of sigma n, then this says nothing because this quantity could be larger than this. But otherwise, this is the state. Good. So this is the main theorem. This is what I'll try to outline the proof of right now. You're not involved in the space of the other. Oh. No, I didn't leave any space intentionally. Yeah. <laughs> I, I don't. I don't understand. <laughs> uh, 
No, you it's know, you're, you're ready to update. Yeah, no, so no, no applications as far as I know. Yeah. Okay, good. So, so, so let me outline. So, this is what uh, what is called a local limit theorem. When you, there's a standard, there's the classical, just like the classical central limit theorem for independent random variables. There's a classical local limit theorem for integer valued random variables. If you have a bunch of integer identically distributed integer random variables and you sum them up, then their distribution is uh, yeah. So we know from the central limit theorem that from far away it looks like a Gaussian, but even point wise for every integer, the probability that it takes any particular integer value is uh, a point wise approximated by a, by a discrete Gaussian. And uh, so this is the analog in, in a setting where uh, uh, the, the random variables are not independent. Yes, that's right. If you get a really good quantitative central limit theorem, then it, uh, it, it implies this. Uh, uh, if somehow you could control the size of the intervals so well, but uh, at least uh, all existing technology for central limit theorems, uh, uh, they have much bigger errors over here and something more has to be done in order to get uh, here. So, uh, so w one statement, for example, that all existing central limit theorems cannot distinguish between uh, the number of triangles always being odd and number of triangles always being even. They cannot distinguish between these two cases. So one, any, any statement of this form would need to in include extra information into the existing kind of statement. So you don't get uh, at this point, it gives no tail bound. There's, the, there's, almo there's no quantitative bound I can put here, or it requires a lot of work to get a very bad bound over here. But uh, very recent follow-up work by Ross Berkowitz, my student sitting over there, uh, it gave uh, gave optimal bounds for this for this kind of statement. So it's now one over n to the two point five. He can show, and uh, and this implies a statistical distance uh, estimates for the distribution of S n from uh, from the the discrete Gaussian distribution. Uh, good. Okay. So so now I'll outline the proof of this. Any any questions about the statement? Of theorem, oh yes. So the the same theorem hold uh, the same theorem like this holds for g and p for constant p between zero and one. I didn't ri write it, but uh, exactly the same theorem holds by the same proof technique of ours. But for other graphs, uh, our method uh, our methods are very specific to triangles, uh, and uh, doing it for other graphs is a really really good open question. And uh, and then there's the more general question of doing it for joint distributions of many graphs at a time, all of which are very are very good questions and very open yeah uh, yeah so a lot of a lot of lucky things happen in the triangle case but i think uh, the the general questions are very very interesting okay good so i'll uh, so i'll now i'll m make a few comments about related statements that were known and uh, and then i'll and then i'll outline the proof of how how this theorem goes so i'll i'll at least be able to say a few things about the ingredients yeah. Uh, just so uh, it may be satisfied with us. Uh -huh. uh, this uh, type of theorem for the graph of triangles and cubes in general, I guess, where you put the limit on you know, the curve for the uh, curve. Okay. Uh. Yeah, that sum of squares there by three will be four. <laughs> <laughs> So, so some closely related statements. Uh, uh, well, yeah. So, one is th th there was a local limit theorem for uh, uh, G for triangles again in G and P when p lies between uh, uh, 1 over n and 1 over root n. 
okay so the 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 setting when p lies between 1 over n 1 over root n is the case where the variance of the number of triangles is uh, and uh, and the ex and the expectation of the number of triangles are o of each other and uh, in this case some other uh, some other tools become available and there was a local limit theorem proved for the number of triangles in this case uh, this is the theorem of Rowland and Ross from 2010. Uh, uh, other related theorems are uh, by uh, Matushek et al. Uh, who showed that uh, the number of triangles mod Q is uniform when uh, uh, Q is uh, between little omega 1 and uh, log n to some power. Uh, so, this is again a statement closely related to this because it is saying that the number of triangles mod Q behaves like it ought to had it uh, had this law been true. Uh, <coughs> And uh, another result by Colitis and myself uh, from 2011, I think, uh, said that the number of triangles mod Q uh, is is yeah is expo is very close to uniform for all Q uh, in for all constant Q. So for every constant Q, the number of triangles is exponentially close to uniform. And uh, exponential in that world, do you think? Exponential. Uh, uh, so that's not what this shows. This shows only exponential in n. Okay. Yeah, but but exponential n square is true by a different argument, and that's known only for triangles. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, good. And so again, uh, the ultimately a local limit theorem uh, seems to be uh, morally equivalent to having a central limit theorem for the distribution, which means at a large scale when you look at it, it looks like uh, like a Gaussian when you look at it from far. And also mod 2 it is uniform and mod 3 it is uniform. If you have a distribution which is uniform mod 2, mod 3, mod 5, mod 7 maybe and it is also at the same time uh, Gaussian when you look at it from far, that is that seems to suggest oh maybe this, this distribution has a local limit theorem. Point wise it looks like a discrete Gaussian and that. Uh, Roughly something like that is actually a theorem that that follows from Fourier analysis, and I'll state it very soon. But just by itself, it's uh, 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 yeah, yeah. But but there's a closely related fact which is not true. Uh, it's a closely related statement that's not a fact, which is, and this came as a big surprise to me. So if you have a random variable which is uniform mod five and it's uniform mod seven, then is it uniform mod thirty-five? So it seems pretty reasonable that this should be true, right? I mean, that's what Chinese remainder theorem is about. But uh, but that is not true, uh, and maybe I'll leave it as an exercise to. Okay, so the plan is we'll uh, we'll take this distribution of S n, we'll take its Fourier transform. We want to show S n is point. The distribution of S n is pointwise close to some distribution. Uh, to show that two, so that's an L infinity bound on the on the probability on the probability mass functions uh, on the difference between the probability mass functions. So to prove an L infinity bound on the difference of two probability mass functions, it suffices to show an L one bound on the difference of their Fourier transforms. Okay, so I'll so I'll now do a little bit of manipulation to to make that a statement. <laughs> okay, so so we had so I'll now define R n to be S n minus mu n over sigma n. Okay, this is this is when, when people talk about central limit theorems, this is the object they study, right? This after you normalize it. Uh, so the central limit theorem says that R n approaches standard normal in distribution. Uh, 
Now, now the main uh, quantity that I look at is the Fourier transform of the distribution of R n. So, psi n of t is uh, the expected e to the i t R n. Okay, so this is a function of t, and uh, look at the expected value e to the i t R n. It's the expectation over the randomness in R n. And uh, right, and this this central limit theorem implies that psi n of t approaches e to the minus t square over 2 point y. Okay, because R n approaches the normal distribution, uh, the Fourier transform of R n, uh, so, so, uh, the Fourier transform of R n approaches the Fourier transform of the normal distribution, which is this. Okay, so, so, so this is uh, this is the this is the main ingredient. Uh, this is one of the main ingredients we'll use ultimately in our proof of the local limit theorem that there is a central limit theorem. So, this the local limit theorem does imply the central limit theorem in some sense, but uh, we are using the central limit theorem as an ingredient in the proof of the local limit theorem. So, the uh, so what we now know is the psi n of t uh, approaches e to the minus t square over 2 point wise. This is this is going to be useful for us. Right, we are not using any quantitative bounds on this convergence and uh, Right, and they they are whatever bounds that end up coming here are quite weak. Uh, good. Okay, so now let's uh, set up the at least the statement that we're trying to prove. Let's set that up in the language of psi n. Okay, so after having take, taken Fourier transforms, let's see what it is that we need to prove. Okay, I'll try to. Okay, so the the first uh, statement is that. Okay, so let me express the probability that. R n is equal to x for some x in terms of psi n. So, this is the Fourier inversion formula. Psi n is the Fourier transform of the distribution of R n. So, I will now do the Fourier inversion. So, this is uh, and this Fourier inversion is going to be not uh, not your standard uh, Fourier inversion. So, R n is uh, not z valued, it is not integer valued, it is uh, integer over sigma n valued after shifting by mu n. So, there is a little bit of uh, fudge that happens. So, I will just tell you this the formula without uh, explaining, uh, yeah, without thinking about it. Uh, yeah, so, it is 1 over 2 pi sigma n, my integral from minus pi sigma n to pi sigma n, uh, psi n of t e to the minus i t x d If uh, if the sigma n wasn't there, then this formula, or if it was one, then this would have been one over two pi integral from minus pi to pi of the of psi n of t e to the minus i t x dt. That's your standard Fourier inversion on for the integers. But now there's a sigma n, and it just complicates the formula by the following. Okay, good. So so this expresses the probability that R n equals any particular x in terms of the Fourier transform psi. N. Okay, so now I'm going to uh, I'm going to try to write. So I want to show ultimately that. Uh, the probability that R n equals any given x is very close to e to the minus x square over 2, uh, 1 over root 2 pi sigma n e to the minus x square over 2. So, I will try to write now the probability that uh, uh, that standard normal value in a formula that looks very similar to this. Okay, so, e to the minus So, I now I now expressed, I, I wrote e to the minus x square over 2 in terms of a Fourier inversion formula 2. And now I am going to show that probability that R n equals x is close to e to the minus x square over 2. Uh, uh, the, the sigma n over here is, is somehow important. So, I am going to write sigma n for times the probability that R n equals x. minus minus x square over 2 is equal to 1 over 2 pi. So, there are two terms in this. 
uh, this term times sigma n and this term. Uh, good, so I will write them slowly one by one. So, it is 1 over 2 pi integral from minus pi sigma n to pi sigma n psi n of t e to the minus i t x e t minus so this is an absolute 1 over 2 pi integral minus infinity to infinity e to the minus t square over 2 e to the minus i t x So, I just wrote these two terms out in terms of the Fourier expansion. Uh, good. No, so, now I will zoom in and I will ah, right. I am going to plug it in. The fact that psi and t approaches e to the minus. The difference. Oh, right. No, but it is so it is point wise. So, for any fixed t, uh, psi and t approaches e to the minus t square over 2. But uh, this is only uh, the note that the, the limits of this integral are not fixed. So, this goes from minus pi n square roughly to pi n square. And uh, but I only, but I cannot take t equal to so square root n and know that psi n of square root n approaches e to the minus square root n square over 2. So, so, th so that will only cover a certain part of this integral and the rest of the integral will be what most of the work will be. So, that, that integral I am going to, I will break it up into many parts. Uh, so, there is going to be the central part, which so, so there is going to be a big constant a. So, a is some big constant. Uh, and I am going to break up this, this integral into many, many parts. So, this is 1 over 2 pi integral from minus a to a psi n of t minus e to the minus t square over 2. Oh, I will let me put in less than or equal to uh, dt. So, I took out the integral from minus a to a from both of these and I wrote that term out, good, or, or maybe I do not need that. Okay, plus integral over r minus minus a to a e to the minus t square over 2 e t. If a is a very large constant, then this integral is can be made an arbitrarily small constant. So, so, this quantity is going to go to 0 by making a a very large constant. So, this term is something I am going to be able to ignore. This is just the integral of e to the minus t square over 2 outside the outside a large constant interval plus now the, the remaining integral is from minus pi sigma n to pi sigma n minus from minus a to a of psi n of t dt. So, there are three terms in the sum. This one is the, so in the central part e, psi n of t has most of its mass and so does e to the minus t square over 2. That That is where most of the mass of both these uh, integrals are. And in the central part, I just need to show that the difference is bounded, the integral of the difference is bounded. So, this is one part I need to handle. Then I look at the tail of the e to the minus t square over 2 part and look at the tail of the psi n of t part and and in both these cases I need to bound the size of these integrals. Yeah, when did you get the error uh, that you can take? You still have one 
Uh, uh, so, why did I get that? Because I put the sigma n into the quantity that I want. So, I looked at sigma n times the probability that r n equals x and I will get an error which is little o of 1. So, so having done that, it lets me prove a sigma n. Okay, good. So, so this part already I know is going to 0. So, because it just for the integral of minus e to the minus t square over 2 dt over an interval over over everything except the central interval of length 2 a and uh, and by choosing a to be arbitrarily large I can make this part go arbitrarily small. So, this part goes away. This part is handled by the central limit theorem because a is a constant uh, for any fixed uh, for any fixed uh, uh, t between minus a and a this point wise goes to 0 and I am looking at uh, the integral of this. The, so, we are looking at the limit of the integrals and uh, yeah, and so that goes to 0 by the dominated convergence theorem. Okay, so, this part is al also goes to 0 by the <coughs> by the central limit theorem by the consequence of the central limit theorem that psi n of t approaches e to the minus t square over 2 point y. Okay, so, so, these two parts are handled and everything is now bounding the the, the characteristic function of of r n right outside minus a to a and within minus pi sigma n to pi sigma n. Okay, so, so, having done all this, let us erase, uh, you can forget about everything I have said so far. I will restate this, uh, this problem that we are looking at and we will and we'll understand what it is about. Yeah. Good. So, again R n was this, I had this, this quantity psi n which is this. And our goal is to show that the integral uh, over absolute value of t greater than a and also less than pi sigma n of psi n of t absolute value dt uh, is little o 1. That is what the goal of this of everything is. Sin of t is the f is expected e to the i t r n, where r n is the number of triangles minus the mean over the variance. Good. And, and in fact, we will show that often sin of t is just very, very small. So, sin of t is actually exponentially small when uh, uh, for some ranges of t and uh, for other ranges of t it will be somewhat small and uh, ultimately the whole question is how small can you bound the, the value, the absolute value of sin of t. Uh, okay, good. So, so here, so we have three separate arguments that cover different ranges of t. That these arguments overlap and cover everything is a bit of a miracle. It's not really clear why, uh, yeah, why we needed so many different arguments, and also why so these many arguments was enough. I don't know. It just uh, yeah. So a lot about why why this finally works is a bit of a mystery. Uh, This is also what limits progress to other graphs, and uh, so uh, actually Ross uh, Ross's proof uh, is much simpler than well, well, it's significantly simpler than ours, and it involves uh, instead of the finally four four arguments that we end up using for bounding sine of t, it uses about two, and it's much cleaner, and it gives quantitative bound. So, so that's something I recommend looking at. Uh, Good. Okay. So I'll now uh, let let me say some things about uh, uh, sine sine of t. I'll to give a sense of how we bound the absolute value of sine of t in different ranges of t. Okay. So first is uh, so here is an argument for t being. So remember, we're looking at t lying between uh, well larger than a constant a, but less than pi times sigma n, and sigma n is around n square. So it t is less than n square, and we need to cover eventually all values of t. So, I will give you an argument that works in this range. Uh, t lies between square root n and n and these are uh, it is well away from square root n, well away from n. Okay, so, 
what is psi n of t? It is the expected e to the i t r n. is expected e to the i t s n over sigma n. So, the, this constant mu n disappears, it is just a constant in this entire calculation. So, we can take that out. Okay, so, so the idea is this, we will uh, first, okay, so here is, uh, here are all the n vertices. I will take a collection of edges which forms a matching and I call that m. This is prior to revealing any randomness of the graph. Okay. So, I just identify a set of potential edges m and I am going to reveal the edges of the graph in two stages. In the first stage, I will reveal all the edges outside m and in the second stage, I will reveal all the edges within m and then we will we'll study what happens to the psi and t uh, in, uh, as we do it in two stages. Uh, right, so uh, yeah, size m equal m has n over two edges. So these are not edges of the f of the revealed graph. These are uh, edges, potential, potential edges. edges. Right, there are n choose two potential edges, and these are n of these, n over two of them. Okay. Uh, okay, then how does the number of triangles look as a function of the edges, as a Okay, so I also let me use some variables. Trying to create independence. I'm trying to create independence. Right. Uh, so uh, for for each edge e, for each potential edge e, I have this variable x e, which is uh, zero or one. Right. This is the indicator of whether the edge appears or not. Okay. So now I'm going to try to express the total number of triangles in this graph in terms of x e's. Okay. So and I want to say that it looks like. Uh, some c which depends on m complement plus sum over all the edges e x e times some c e some constant c which depends again on the on the how the rest of the graph was revealed okay so uh, the the main question the main point is take that edge if that appears or if it doesn't appear what happens to the total number of triangles in the graph if it does appear then the number of triangles in the graph increases by the number of v's that are anchored at that particular edge. If there are c e v's that are anchored at that particular edge, then the total number of triangles in the graph increases by c e every time that edge x e appears. Okay, so, the, the shape of s n is some constant depending only on the uh, on randomness outside m plus sum over all e c e x e, where c depends on the randomness outside uh, m again and x e is the edge e. So, these are the edges in m. This is how s n looks. Okay, so, we will take this and we will look, look at this expression and we will see that, oh, this helps us. Um, now, it looks like a sum of independent random variables and, uh, and we will be able to do something else with it. Yes, but for bounding the expected e to the i t, that that is all about cancellation. So, yeah, so it does not matter that this is larger in magnitude than this. Uh, I mean, this, this is enough to make that, ex, that exponential sum go become small. Right, the, the place where it is dominant really affects the case where t is really small and that was already handled by the central limit theorem. Right, so, uh, so with high probability over the edges outside m, uh, all c e's are about n over 4. Right. How many v's do you, do you expect to be anchored on any one particular edge? Well, 
the probability of any one particular path showing up is one fourth and there are n n minus 2 potential other such paths. So, all the CEs are about n over 4, this is the number of v's anchored at any one particular edge. So, then so, so conditioning on on edges outside m satisfying this uh, expected value of e to the i t s n over sigma n is equal to expected e to the i t some constant c plus uh, summation c e x e over sigma n. This c is a constant, uh, so and I'm I'm all, I've already revealed the randomness outside m. So this is only over the randomness of sitting inside the edges of m. So this c is a constant. It it just doesn't affect the absolute value of this in any way. So it can take it out. So this is the same as expected over all the xes. E and m. E to the i t. So that's gone, and now uh, summation. C E X E and now by independence of the, the X E's, uh, but it's E to the I T C over sigma n that is some fixed constant that comes out in ab and in absolute value it is 1 and so it is always yeah. Good. So, so now this I can now factor as product over all the edges expected over just x e e to the i t c e x e over sigma n. Uh, absolute value. Good. And and so now I'm going to so now this is really of a simple form. This e to the i t uh, a 0 1 var variable times a fixed constant okay. and uh, uh, and it is a fixed constant which I basically know because c is basically n over 4. Uh, good, so, so, so let us look inside this a little bit. So, uh, so here is a fact e expected e to the i over a random bit b in 0 1 e to the i uh, let us say alpha b is 1 minus alpha over 2 pi the distance to the nearest integer square okay, is just this this is a, a, a good estimate for the size of e to the the expected e to the i alpha b for a constant alpha. So, I will just plug that into this. Uh, this is product over all e's. I will also replace all the c's by about n over 4. So, I will just replace it. I am only sketching proofs here uh, times 1 minus the distance to the nearest integer of t times n over 4 over sigma n square and the total number of edges in this matching was n over 2. Okay, so now, so, uh, so now allow me to be rough, so this 4 I do not care for because uh, ultimately I only had less than less than and greater than greater than in my condition on t. So, I mean this up to constants it is all same sigma n is just n square up to constants. So, n and n square go away. So, this is t over n. So, this whole thing is e to the minus ah, ah, ah good. Right, Bec now because t is much less Right, 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 good. Uh, yeah, but since t is less than less than n, uh, t over n is very close to 0. So, the close the distance to the closest integer 0 is actually t over n. So, so this quantity is 1 minus t over n square without the no, without this distance to the closest integer. So, this is 1 minus t over n square whole to the n over 2. And so, now I do this in terms of e which is at most e to the minus t square over n. So right. There is no y over e over there because 
Oh, right, right, right. Right. So, as long as t is larger than root n, this uh, this thing is really small. As long and I needed that t was much smaller than n in order for this to in order to replace the distance to the closest integer with just the value of the number itself. Good. So, this was a, one example of an argument that handles one range of t's. Okay. Uh, in order to handle t's which are less than root n, one does a similar argument where instead of leaving just a matching unexposed, you have a union of matchings uh, and, and one needs to understand. So, then there will be a linear term. So, then the, the expression for the number of triangles will have a big constant term which will be irrelevant a linear term where most of the action will happen and a quadratic term and uh, the goal is to sh show that the qu the quadratic term is actually uh, very small compared to the to the linear term so it does not affect the calculations that you do with the linear term and then one can do an argument very similar to this uh, so it has some delicate aspects but, uh, but but that allows one to extend the range of t down all the way to an arbitrary large constant so the delicate argument is specific to the structure or you use some Oh no, it's uh, so nothing deep is used. There's only a Chebyshev inequality in there, but uh, uh, yeah, but it is specific to triangles. It it isn't an argument that would work for for general. Uh, oh, it could work. I mean, if you if you use just one of the generic terms for for quadratic segment representation by the multiple. Uh, oh no, th then it might. Uh, no, oh right. No, it won't be good enough. You do need to know what those coefficients are. It does use some information about what those coefficients are. The coefficients of, that the C's are uh, around n over four, and the coefficients of x e x e prime are not too big, and things like that. Uh, good. So this is one example of an argument. Let me give you another example of an argument that works in a regime of high t. Uh, how much time do I have? Yes, we, uh, we have about uh, ten or fifteen minutes. Ah, good. Okay. Okay, so another argument for t uh, close to, oh, I guess, okay, so t equal to theta of n square. It will also work for slightly larger. Okay, yeah, sure, maybe. Yeah. n less than less than t less than less than n square. No, I can, I can fix this fine. Yeah. Okay. Phi sigma n. Okay, so the, all the way up to the to the upper range. Okay, so so here. Uh, okay, so let let me just take an example. T is equal to pi sigma n over seven. Okay, in this case, uh, expected e to the i t r n is oh, oh, is the same as expected e to the i t over sigma n times s n which is expected e to the i pi s n over 7 okay and and this is roughly counting the distribution of uh, the number of triangles mod 7 Okay, so, so questions of, uh, of t being very large, I like counting the distribution of triangles mod uh, mod 7 or some mod some small number. But of course, this could need not be pi times sigma n over 7, it could be pi times sigma n over, well not over pi, uh, oh actually over pi, yeah. So, it, this could be not, it need not just be a rational number over here, but ultimately I mean the, the, the range of large t is, is some kind of uniform distribution of uh, uh, of S n mod mod maybe a small real number or something like that. Okay, so so let uh, 
let me give an example of what happened in this case. So, so here uh, the kind of experiment that we will study is this. I will take n, n minus 1 of the vertices out here and one vertex out separately and I am going to reveal the edges of the graph in two stages. I uh, will reveal the edges inside this these n minus 1 vertices first and then I will reveal what happens outside. But it would not just be in one shot, it would not just be a simple two stage conditioning, there will be some game of understanding how, how this quantity changes when you take two distinct revelations of the edges coming out of this. So, so, so let me let me introduce some notation for this whole language and then we will see. So, so this is the set V and this single vertex is the set U which later on I will make it many vertices. So, so it start off as the set U ok and uh, ok or maybe not ok fine it is the vertex U ok and uh, the edges that get revealed within this set V I will I will let that be denoted by A which is an element of 0 1 to the v choose 2 right because that is what it takes to tell me what all edges got revealed here and I will have a vector b which is a vector in 0 1 to the v which is which are then which vertices in v are joined to u. Okay, so these two determine how the all the edges in the graph. Okay, so le let's say, let's study what is the total number of triangles in the in this graph as a function of a and b. So then, S n the total number of triangles is equal to some quantity that depends on a, the total number of triangles exclusively within a, plus some more terms. So what are the other terms? Well if the vertex u is adjacent to something and to something else and there happens to be an edge between those two vertices then uh, yeah then then i want to count a 1 over there okay so so let me introduce one more piece of notation this is going to be the so this is going to be the tensor of b with itself okay so b tilde is a vector in 0 1 to the v choose 2 where the i j coordinate of b tilde is b i times b j ok. So, it extends this vector of length n into a vector of length n choose 2 by taking tensors ok. So, so I here I take the inner product of b tilde with a. So, the total uh, so this is if the vertex u happens to be connected to vertex i and vertex j then b tilde will have a 1 there and a happens to join vertex i to vertex j then i want to i want to count so so this is the to the, the final form it's just some fancy notation but it's not uh, but it's just expressing how the total number of triangles depends on a and b So, now psi n of t is expected, well in absolute value it is already expected e to the i t s n over sigma n which is expected over a and b e to the i t, uh, well ok I will now write it out, oh t was bad, okay, let, me, let me change that to that is also bad ok fine triangle a triangle of a plus b tilde inner product a ok. So, this by itself is hard to analyze because this triangle away is a very complicated notion. So, I am going to do a, a little Cauchy Schwartz trick that will remove the the appearance of triangle away from this expression completely. So, psi n of t square is well it is at most expected over a 
expected over B is the I T triangle away plus B tilde A square. Right. So, so th this is this is this is the step that will get rid of what all the complications that happen within A. Okay. So, I mean, sine of T square is by definition absolute value outside square, and I bring it in. Okay, and then I get the inequality. Okay, now I open this out. I to open this out. You, this is the expected value of this times an independent copy of this with a minus sign with a complex conjugated with a B prime over here. So, uh, so this is equal to expected over A, expected over B and B prime e to the i t. Now, two independent copies of this, one subtracted from the other. So, triangle of A plus B tilde A minus triangle of A plus B prime tilde A. So, this gets rid of the triangle of A component dependence. Uh, and 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 it becomes quite simple now. So it's expected over b and b prime e to the i t. Oh, sorry. Expected over a e to the i t inner product of. Ah, this is a bad place to find. I guess I'll. Okay, I'll move it up. <laughs> over b and b prime expected over a e to the i t inner product of b tilde minus b tilde prime b prime tilde with a there is over sigma n everywhere too by the way so I forgot to write this uh, good Okay, and, and now this is a quantity that I can uh, try to understand carefully because uh, A, so we are taking an inner product, A is now, a, uh, it is a totally uniform 0, 1 to the n choose 2 vector and I am taking the inner product of that with a fixed vector B minus B prime. Okay, so I will fix that out and uh, look at what happens to this inside inner product okay, and this is something that I can analyze quite easily. Yeah, so, so to analyze that, uh, yeah, so I, I say with high probability over B and B prime, with very, very high probability with over B and B prime, B tilde minus B prime tilde. Remember, what is B tilde? B tilde is, uh, well, B was a uniform 0, 1 vector. B tilde is the tensor of it, of it with itself. So it became a much longer vector, again, full of zeros and 1s. B prime tilde is another such vector. So, we are taking two such vectors and we are looking at their difference. Uh, the claim is that this will have many non-zero entries. There will be a constant fraction of these entries which are non-zero. Okay. So, mm, has, has, yeah, right, has only, ha, has many, uh, right, exactly. So, the non-zero entries are only plus ones and minus one and uh, constant fraction of the entries will be plus one, constant fraction will be minus one and the rest will be zero. Has constant fraction of plus minus 1 entries. Good. So, I condition on that happening. Right? So, that will and I am taking that I go in and understand the inner term expected over A e to the i t b tilde minus b prime tilde with A. And now there's independence again because A is just, uh, I mean, each thing is independent, and we're looking at a sum of it's like a linear polynomial up here. So I do exactly the same uh, uh, thing. So this is equal to product over uh, omega n square entries 
a sub e, right? So these omega n square entries are the ones which have constant, uh, which which have either plus or minus one entries there. So of two pi maybe. Right, so this this is sum each of these terms. So this is a big sum with a sub e and a coefficient of that a sub e being uh, either plus one or minus one for omega n square of these entries. So it's e to the i t over sigma n times plus minus a random bit, and we're looking at the product of that. So so this is this is what we get. Okay, the the what the advantage of what we have right now is that we have omega n square different entries here. So this is going to be something raised to the power omega n square. So it's going to be better for us. Uh, uh, so this is and again the closest integer is zero. Again, the closest integer is zero is because sigma n is around n square and t is less than. In fact, t is less than pi sigma n. So we so the closest integer will be uh, less than zero. So and in the extreme case when t is pi sigma n. I mean, the value of this is a half, and the closest integer is still zero. Or the value of this is slightly less than half, so the closest integer is still zero. So it's one minus t over two pi sigma n square whole to the omega n square now, which is uh, e to the minus t square. So oh yeah, so now and now I start getting sloppy. I, I I forget the constant. So this becomes t square over n square whole square times no 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 the square is already done a t square of n to the four times omega n square with e to the minus t square over n square good so for any t which is uh, larger than n this is exponentially small Good. So, so this argument covers the range of t being between n and n square. The other argument covers the range of t between root n and n. Uh, the covering t around n is uh, is not covered. These arguments did not cover t around n. That is a that is a. I mean, that's very important. The range around n is not some tiny quantity. It's 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 actually very big. Uh, so, so there's a variation of this argument where instead of just revealing. Uh, you instead of having an a and a single vertex outside, you can have a bunch of vertices, and in the final argument, you would need to use around omega n vertices outside, and understand the dependence uh, of the total number of triangles on the total number of triangles that get revealed within the set V, as well as uh, uh, yeah, as and along with some cauchy schwarz tricks of how how the different Bs interact with it. So so it's a similar argument, and it allows you to cover the entire range of uh, uh, t all the way from root n up to up to up to sigma uh, up to sigma n and as i said th there is the matching argument and a variation of the matching argument that covers t being very small up to t being around n uh, good so and then a union of all these arguments managed to cover up the entire interval uh, yeah i mean it wasn't clear that it yeah at some point uh, during this project it wasn't clear that there would ever be a union of arguments that covered the entire interval, but I mean, it ha so happened that it was. Now, for other graphs, it's a very good question to be able to prove uh, local limit theorems. Uh, some of the tricks that we use are uh, very specific to triangles, some are not that specific. Uh, yeah, so it would be very nice. Uh, even another very nice question is the, the, this, the question of joint distributions of subgraph counts. There, it's not even, in many cases, it's not even clear what to conjecture as the, as the joint distribution. Uh, recently, Ross and I have been working, and we, we seem to have a law for the joint distribution of triangles and edges, uh, which requires a bunch of extra ad hoc tricks. Anyway, so uh, right now, this the uh, this area of questions is f at least what's going on is bunch uh, is full of ad hoc tricks, and it would be really nice to have a nice clean way of understanding everything. Uh, good. Okay, so that's all. Thanks.